If you want to get started in animation or motion graphics, or you just want to take your own videos and editing to the next level, you don't need After Effects. Here are five beginner tips, tricks, and effects for the Fusion page in DaVinci Resolve, which is free. If you are starting from scratch, the only thing you need to know is that I have a blank timeline here. And in my effects library, in effects, I'm going to drag Fusion Composition onto my timeline. Then I can click this button to open the Fusion page and we can get started. First is a line stroke animation. Fusion is run off nodes. So the first thing I'm actually going to do is make a background node. If I preview this in one of my viewers by pressing one or two, you'll see I have this plain back background and we can adjust settings in the inspector to make that any color we want. And in this type, you can even change this up to do something like a gradient. Now, what we will actually animate is the mask on this background node. This node has a blue input and that is a mask input on any node. Blue means that mask input. So in the default layer, I'm going to come up to this little circle shape here, which will create an ellipse mask. I'll click that. If I had background selected, it would have connected. Uh, but since I didn't, I have to take the output of this ellipse mask and pull it down over that background node. If I let go, it will automatically attach that blue input. And now I have this circle with that gradient on it. What I want to do is come into these ellipse, uncheck solid, and then pull up this border width so that now we just have this line over that gradient. And when I uncheck solid, we got a few new options, including cap style, position, and length. If I start to pull down this length, you'll see that that line backs up until it is almost just gone. If you come all the way to zero, you still have this dot, and that is because of this cap style. If you change it to this first option, it will go away completely. So if I wanted a basic ride on, I could set a keyframe at the beginning of my sequence at zero, come forward a little bit, pull up length. And when I change that, it will automatically set a keyframe. And now that will just write on. Additionally, you also have this position. If I come to somewhere in the middle and change this position, you see that also rotates a little. So I could actually come and keyframe that position along with this length. If I also have that going from zero to one, you'll see now that swings around and it goes completely around the circle once as it writes on, but that's up to you. I'm actually gonna right click on that and remove those keyframes I had on there. So we just have this plane right on again. And these options exist across different masking options. If I create a new polygon node here, I can preview that. And if I just go super crazy with this shape, connect that up. You see, we have a funky shape. It is solid. I will uncheck solid. And then if I do the same deal, pulling up border width again, changing that cap style, I can set similar keyframes on this coming, pulling the length down and then pulling that back up. And then if I replace that ellipse mask with this new polygon mask, when I preview that background node, it will ride on this new funky shape. Number two is smooth animation. I'm going to still use this same example of the circle writing on. Now, if I preview that ellipse, you can see on this parameter, I have just two keyframes on that length, zero to one. And if we watch that, it does play back very linear. It goes around at the same speed and then it finishes. I'm going to click this spline viewer button up here. And if I have that node selected, then we will see this ellipse option. This is actually a setting I've engaged in these three dots over here. You can see I have show only selected tool. If you check this, then you do have to click the selected node for that node to appear in the slime viewer. If you uncheck this, then you will see every node that has a keyframe on it all at the same time, all the time. And if I want to quickly scan to where I have keyframes, I can click this button here to zoom to fit. And now we have a visual representation of those keyframes. And we can see as it plays back and just goes and then it's done. But what I can do is I can select both those keyframes. And if I just click F, then it will flatten out each of those. And now we have these handy bars as well. And if I hold Alt, I can drag those out and they will stay snapped. Or I can press T and that gives us custom number inputs for both easing in and easing out. So if I change this to something um, I really like, like 70 in and 50 out, I'll double check that, select both of them. Yeah, 70, 50 in. Then now if I preview this, it will sort of whip on and you see it takes a lot longer to finish that last little stretch. That's that pretty extreme 70% uh, sort of ease coming in here. So it goes whips and then finishes up nice and slick. Quick bonus tip. You remember I clicked F to flatten, but there is one other option you should know about. If I were to pull up these keyframes and actually select all those, and I'm going to click this second option down in these options below to change that back to linear. I could have also clicked S. And if you have two keyframes, that will look exactly the same, but it changes if you are dealing with more than two keyframes. Let me illustrate. Check this out. I have a simple animation I've rigged up where this green circle comes scales up and then back. I will actually change this so it is a little more extreme, something like that. So you see it scales up and then goes back down. If I were to select all of those and click F, then you can see on this curve, it flattens all of those. So now it goes, and it, it feels better. But if I clicked all of those and clicked S, 
look at this curve. It looks a little bit different now. That middle keyframe is now no longer flat. It has looked at the keyframes bef before it and sort of smoothed it out. That's what the S stands for, smooth. So now it actually expands a little past where it's supposed to go, but then snaps back. Both useful tools. You just want to be aware of which one you are using and why. Number three, text animation. There is some pretty tremendous depth to the text animation tools available inside Fusion. We're going to keep it pretty basic. Uh, I'm going to click this icon here to load up a text plus effect. Also, we haven't mentioned it so far, but if you press shift space, it will pull up this little select tool search bar and you could always type in text, come down to text plus, click enter, and that will bring in that as well. But we're going to preview this first text, type in something like, hello, scale that up a little bit. And now if I right click in this text box, we have some really cool options. The one I specifically want now is follower. I will click that. And then now we will have this new option right up here next tools that says modifiers. I can click that and we see our follower modifier. The way this follower modifier works is that we're going to dive in and effectively set up the animation we want for a single letter. And this first page here actually uh, tells this follower how we want that single letter animation to play out across the rest of the letters in our scene, specifically this delay type option. We have between each character or between the first and last character. This is really valuable, especially if you're creating something like templates or something you want to reuse a lot because the between each character option, if you have more characters, the entire animation will take longer, but this between first and last character, uh, however few or many letters you have, the overall animation will always take the same time. I'm going to do it between each letter, pull up this delay just a bit, and then I'm going to hop over to the shading tab here. Shading tabs are a whole other world of text options. They're very cool, but that that is its own deal. I have a video just about shading text. Now what I'm going to do is come to my beginning of my scene. I'm going to come down to position and I'm going to set a keyframe on offset uh, that will pop up this path. You don't super need to worry about this for now, but I'm going to hop back to follower. Now come back just a few frames because remember we are just doing a single letter and then that will sort of be interpolated forward. I'm going to click that offset again and then I'm actually going to go back to my previous keyframe because remember I haven't changed any of these yet and I'm going to pull down the Y value and you can see now that it's shifting the entire word. And even with that, if I start playing through, you'll see, wow, this letter is going one at a time it animates across, but you can still see the entire word before it gets moving. So again, I'm going to go to where that second keyframe is also set a keyframe on opacity, go back to the first keyframe and then pull that opacity all the way down as well. And then now we have this option where each letter fades as it moves up. Now you'll notice that is also still really linear. So like we just learned previously, I can open up my spline viewer, find this line here. This is following both that movement and opacity. So if I select both those keyframes, press flatten, pull up the ease in on that then it won't be nearly as harsh. And then it will just sort of, ooh, nice, slick text animation. We sort of touched on this earlier, but number four is alpha mats or basic masking. It's again, also its own world, but very powerful. Like I said, on a lot of nodes, this blue triangle is that masking input. Again, if I uh, disconnect this circle we made and preview just this gradient background, now I can actually take that text I made, take the output of that, even though that exists on its own, I can take the output of that, funnel that into the background. And now we have that same color overlay. I could always do that on the text itself. But again, there might be specific situations where you want to combine several elements and then have all of them come through the same gradient. Now you can do that. For example, if I created a merge node and actually connected that text and that ellipse mask, now depending on which is in the foreground or background, you will get this black background as well. But that is how it's sort of treating mask data. This looks like a black and white image, but actually because it is mask data, just like if I previewed this ellipse node by itself, you see you have that black background. This isn't really black. It's showing you mask data. So white is solid, black is transparent. So now if I take the output of that merge, funnel it into the background, now we have that circle and the text which animates on. Oh, the circle also animates. I forgot that. So now if I wanted to change the color of both of those at the same time, they're coming into this background and I could totally do that. Another bonus tip, you want something pretty funky? Check this out. Uh, coming out of this, I'm going to create a transform node. This has all your basic options like position or center, uh, size, rotation, that stuff. So I'm just going to shift this a little to the right. Notice I'm not previewing this node, so I can do that. Click two. So yeah, it has shifted that entire thing to the little right, but even effects can be masked. So if I create a simple square mask here, stretch this out to the side, 
and then take the output of the rectangle into the transform mask, you'll see that seems to have undone some of it. And yeah, that is because this transform effect, that shift is now being masked. So it is only applying that transform inside this rectangle mask. So if I animate this or just like move it by hand up and down, you see that yeah, inside the box is where it shifts over to the right. This is foundational, but very, very cool. And number five is looping animation. Very quickly, I'm going to uh, delete that mask and reset this transform node. And I'm actually gonna come forward a little bit until this is completely on screen. Then I'm gonna set a keyframe on size come forward a little bit and pull this down quite a bit. In my spline viewer, I will go ahead and flatten that. And here we're actually gonna expand a little beyond looping animation because we have some really cool options here, kind of like where I went to linear earlier. We have some really powerful options next to that. First, we have options to hold those keyframes so, so that it just like clicks in either at the beginning or at the end. But then we also have this reverse option if you want it to start one way or other, that's super useful, I use that all the time. And then we also have set loop. I'm gonna change that back to smooth. So if I select those and then click this set loop, you'll notice, hey, this is pretty interesting. And so when it hits, hits that second keyframe, it instantly jumps back to that first keyframe. So this will actually go down and then up and it just does that same sort of pulsing pattern. Now, you might've thought that would look a little bit differently because what you actually wanted is to ping pong. This is something I could have manually done. If I undo that, I could have come forward a few more frames and pulled this size back up and then selected those and gone back to loop. And then here it would actually come down and up and down and up. But I could still do that with just two keyframes. Check this out. I'll select those and next to that loop option, we have set ping pong. So now you have this representation down here again. Now just based on those two keyframes, it goes down and then back and then down and then back. And you can adjust all these keyframes after the fact. If I stretch that out, then it will take longer in general. If I adjust the easing for that, that can look way different. And then finally, the last two options, if I undo that, and I'll just go to linear. The final option for sort of auto motion that we have here is set relative. If I click that, you'll notice past that second keyframe, it looks at the motion it was taking and just continues that. So even though my keyframe ends here, it looks at where it was moving and it just keeps going. I wanted to make this video because I saw a Twitter thread that was running through all of these examples and how to do them in After Effects for people who wanted to dive in. And I thought, hey, uh, if you want to do all that stuff, you don't need to pay for After Effects. But I'm super passionate about people diving in for the first time. And if this is a world you want to pursue, you don't need a monthly subscription to get started. If there are other animation or motion graphics basics you would like me to cover, or specific things you know you can do in After Effects, but you're not sure if you can do them for free infusion, let me know in the comments. I'll be hanging out there. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.